So, um, and uh, Matthias, did you did you check if you can share screen with us? Do you do you mm. have co-host? We can can try that now. Let me just see if I, if it works. See. And now, I think. Okay, so, fantastic, great. Okay, so well, um, welcome everybody to the to the colloquium today. Um, uh, thanks, Brian, for this wonderful introduction to to the field. So it's a great pleasure to have Matthias Troyer here from um, from Microsoft Quantum, where he's a distinguished scientist. So Matthias is. Um, is probably one of the world's leading compu computational condensed matter physicists. Um, he's, um, he's winner of the Raman Prize and the Hamburg Prize for theoretical physics. But more to the point, he spent many years thinking about, uh, you know, think single-mindedly about how you can get towards quantum advantage. So it's a great privilege to have Matthias talk to us about it. Please, uh, Matthias. Thank you. You you so yes, in my my like past life, I was a condensed matter physicist, and I got to the point where I said to really make progress, I would love to have quantum hardware because I know how to solve these problems really easily once I have a quantum your computer so that's why I then joined Microsoft and in the, the meantime I've learned new jobs I've worked on the qubit modeling I've learned to work with customers and now my new role is that of the systems architect thinking about what is needed to really build the quantum computer. And the basic questions I'm asking today is what do we need to really solve practical problems of problems we're not interested in, in with quantum hardware. And the basics is that new physics always leads to new technologies. The thermodynamics led to the invention of the steam engine and the industrial revolution. Electromagnetism led to electronics, to computers, cell phones, and much more. And quantum physics is now more than a century old, but we're only starting to think about what else could we do with quantum the systems. And what I'm interested in is what I call a practical quantum advantage. So I'm interested in really solving a useful problem that is useful either academically or for an industry faster, better on a quantum computer than on any known classical computer. I'm not interested in saying, is this quantum annealer 10 times slower, faster than, 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 than uh, my laptop? I'm not interested in whether some random circuit can be done better on quantum hardware than classical one, but I really want to solve a problem, a problem that interests somebody. And I want to do it better than on, on any classical computer. Can you think where I say, hey, the, we know we can't do it classically, but quantumly we can. That's really the interesting application. And that's why it's worth investing in building the quantum hardware. And when you then listen to people, there's a maze of proposed applications. One reads lots in the media about how quantum computers will help with big data, how they will cure cancer, design new drugs, sold proteins, predict the stock market, and so on. There are loads of things where people claim that this is all what quantum will solve. But looking at that, for each of these, there's always one of the known quantum algorithm that can somehow be applied. But this looks more to me, I said, like the hope for a quantum wishing well. These are all the hard problems for which I want a solution. And we would need to see now what of those problems can really be tackled by quantum computers. And the starting point, of course, is a quantum algorithm with quantum speed up and 
the most comprehensive list is on the quantum algorithm so by Stephen Jordan. But then that is only the start because most of the work on algorithms so far in the past has been on complexity theory of it. So it is the asymptotic scaling. When the problem size gets big enough, the complexity increases slower quantumly than classically. But in order to really realize that, I want to go to a problem size where quantum is faster than classical. For small problems, classical is faster because it's simpler and cheaper to build, the clock rates are faster, and it's only for the big sizes where quantum will win. And I want to look at the cost of a size where the cost of it happens and the time, because I care about solving a problem in a few weeks and not in a millennium, not as methodically. And so the question is, what are the problems where the cost of a time can be short enough that it could be practical in the next decades? And for that, I now want to compare a classical system with a quantum system. I want to totally bias it towards the quantum system. I want to say, let me put in the race on the classical side, a single of today's classical chip, the most advanced chip of your NVIDIA with with me a 50, 4 billion transistors. I want to say, let's take one of those. And quantumly, I envision that in some time we'll build a machine with 10,000 logical qubits, fast ones with a logical cycle time of a few microseconds. And let me ignore data movement by assuming that with some matching we'll manage all, to all, all, all your connectivity. And I want to compare those two to see what could this future quantum computer do better than a single classical chip that I can just buy today. And there, I want to start and debunk some hype. One thing one often hears is quantum computers will solve the big data problem. But when you look at that quantum computer in the classical one, the classical chip can read 10 terabit a second. The quantum computer, with 10,000 qubits at the clock speed of your 10 microseconds can read about one gigabit a second. So that future quantum machine is about a factor 10,000 slower for classical IO than today's classical computer. And thus it is very clear to all, I think, just looking at that, it's not for big classical data. But quantum computers will excel on big compute problems on small data or maybe on problems on quantum data that we have to find. But then mentioning that, one often also hears that quantum RAM, QRAM will solve this. And I've tried to understand that and the colleagues here helped me understand what QRAM is about, how it speeds things up. And the way I like to present it in a simplified way, and that's something we can talk about later, is basically the idea behind QRAM is I'm taking the classical computer with the IO system and putting everything into a quantum superposition. So the idea of this QRAM Oracle is in a simplified way, you take a hard disk and you can read all the data at once, basically by putting the read head of the hard drive in a quantum superposition of all the locations on the disk. And to, so to, to anybody who builds mechanical quantum systems or, or quantum devices is clear, the, 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 the dissipation will stop that. This is not scalable because it's analog, there's, there's noise decoherence, and it is a beautiful theoretical idea but to really implement it, we need a quantum error correction. And then the scaling goes back to be proportional to the data size. It would be great if somebody could make that really rigorous and give us a bound on what it takes in a default tolerant way. But that's why I'm saying 
I really want to focus on the small data problems that are hard to compute. And there, the, the naif way of saying it, it is quantum computers are faster because they can explore exponentially many inputs at once. But we know all, it's, it's not that easy because while it can uh, 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 compute in, 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 in superposition, I need more than that because I need to be able to read out the results. And when I just look at the answer, then I get just some random output that won't help me. And so we need to go beyond that. And one way of extracting the data would be with Grover search, Grover's algorithm with a quadratic speed up over the classical computing. So it may not be, a, be ultimately extra, so exponentially faster, but in many cases we can get at least a quadratic speed up. And so I want to look into how do the numbers work out by comparing that classical chip with the future quantum computer. And today's classical chip are amazingly fast. The, 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 the chip PU from the, from the NVIDIA can do 300 terabytes operations per second. The, 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 with near 60 the, the, the bit of the floating think your point numbers, or it could do about five petter op for logical operations. And if I build an ASIC with the, 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 the same number of your transistors, then it could be a bit faster. On the quantum computer, if I want to do a logical operation, then I can do about a few million operations per second. If you want to do a floating point operation, then assuming, all, assuming that I ignore all the cost of data movement and layout, ignoring all the overhead of reversible computation, the peak performance that I could get is a few thousand operations per second. So we see just comparing a single classical chip with that future 10,000 logical qubit quantum machine, the quantum machine is 10 to 12 orders of magnitudes slower than the classical one. But there's a constant slowdown. The quantum machine will then win with quantum speed up because it scales better as we go to larger systems. But if we now think about it, I can overcome that constant slowdown because I have to make fewer calls to an oracle. But if the constant slowdown is about 10 to the 12, then I have to make 10 to the 12 fewer calls. That means with quadratic speed up, I start winning if quantumly I make 10 to the 12 calls versus classically 10 to the 24. Or with cubic speed up, it looks a bit better. It's a million versus 10 to the 18. But they need to make 10 to the 12 times fewer call because the machine is a constant of about 10 to the 12 slower. And now you can turn that around and ask, if we have quadratic speed up, what is the time I need to do that? And I think one can see it right here, the time to do 10 to the 24 operations is years or months at least. So quadratic speed up may not be enough. And I turned it around and said, how many operations can I do in one call to the Oracle so that the cost over time is not more than, about, than a few weeks? And the answer is simply with floating point operations, I can't get there with the, the assumptions I made on the quantum machine and a single classical one, I just can't have it. But if I have a very simple oracle with just a few up to 70 logical operations, then with those assumptions, the quantum machine might win. But it's still very optimistic for quantum, pessimistic for classical. And so I'd say clearly we need more than quadratic speedups. Quadratic speedups are beautiful in theory, but if you want to build a machine and calculate something faster than classically, 
then I will need more than quadratic speedups. If I go to cubic speedups, I can do a bit more, 20,000 operations. So I think that's when it starts getting interesting. And when I want to look at what is now the real cost of doing that on the quantum machine, and couldn't I solve the problem by just having 100 GPUs? So really, we want exponential speedups. That's where we have the best chance. And so from that whole list of problems that one often hears, I like to drop out all of the problems that are big data problems, machine learning problems, weather prediction, stock market. This is all tied to the data. And the proposals for problems like protein folding and drug design are also often tied to Grover speed up. So those I'd like to drop out and I really think we need to focus on the algorithms with exponential speed up. And what do we have to, that we can do there? One problem is factoring. Then I'm not that interested in factoring numbers. There's not a, the great application where I solve a real problem. But there are the, 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 the other problems where that, uh, that I'm interested in and where there can also be exponential quantum speed up. And those are problems of quantum systems, simulating quantum systems. When I simulate a simple molecule like caffeine, then I can't do it exactly brute force. But with the, the, the methods you mentioned in the, 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 the tutorial, we have good enough classical approximations that let me simulate a molecule you'll adapt it like in a caffeine on a classical clear computer. I can predict its properties, it works. But there are other molecules, like here I mentioned the, the, the Negefemoko complex, where we don't have any known classical algorithm that can calculate it well enough. And so there are these problems in chemistry and in game material science where we have no way of solving them to the level we want to get to on a classical computer, but where a quantum computer can do it. One example also is a leaf is green. When you look outside in the spring and the leaves come up, then you see the green everywhere. So nature knows the leaf is green, but calculating the color of chlorophyll is hard classically. And why is that? It is because nature is quantum and classical computers are not. And that's why, why Nege Feynman decades back said really to, to, to simulate your quantum physics, to, to, to simulate your quantum problems, we, we need quantum hardware. We should think of uh, uh, a computer that works on quantum mechanical principles, as we all know. And they already exist in some way because the first such machines were analog, just like in the classical world where the, the first computers were given analog ones, also. So, so the, the quantumly, people started yeah, building yeah, the, the simulators for the, 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 the special purpose for the machine that could solve yeah, so, so, the, certain yeah, the, 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 the quantum models already more than a decade ago. For example, using yeah, so, like ultra cold, cold, yeah, cold, cold, Called the cold, cold atomic gases, where people take an atom, trap it in a trap shown on the left here. They 
more lasers to it and build a special purpose computer, analog one, to really build that model in the lab and measure things on it. And with that, one can do models that are hard classically. But how do we know whether it, it works or not? So the first thing done was really one takes a model that one knows how to, 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 to solve classically and tests it and validates it. And, we've, and uh, the, the, this is something we've done 12 years back with uh, the, 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 the the, the, the group of your did, did Emmanuel Block, we took bosons, uh, uh, gas of your bosons in a lattice. We simulated that classically. We simulated it on the quantum device analog, and we compared and we wanted to show that it agrees. And the answer was, of course, at first it didn't agree at all, it was just nonsense. And then we looked closer and we realized that it did not agree because we didn't really understand what was built. But once we understood how the, the quantum gear simulator worked, then we got to this picture. The back row are the classic results, the front row, the quantum results. I here show the, 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 the the momentum distribution function of bosons in a lattice. Left is cold, right is hot. At hot, there's no feature. At low temperatures, when you cool down, you see at some point here, the, so the Uh, the, the, the secondary the, the, the peak appears, and that's where the Bose gas forms a so called Bose Einstein condensate. And the agreement between the, 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 the quantum gas simulation in the front row and the classic one is really great. So those systems work. We can build non trivial quantum simulators that solve certain quantum models. And then you can go to problems that are hard classically. You can go to fermions, for the ionic atoms, atoms that simulate your, your electrons, or you can go to dynamics. Uh, and here's and the, 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 the example of a 10 year old paper that shows a quench in uh, uh, one dimensional gas of your bosons. The classical calculation is stop off there a while since the algorithms become unreliable, the quantum ones continue. Now here, there's not much features in there, it equilibrates basically, but one sees there could be models when dynamics, you can go to points that are classically hard, but quantumly achievable. And so already the uh, decade back, one saw that with the lock your quantum simulations, there is an advantage of quantum hardware over classical one. But it's analog. And just like classical machines that are analog, it is limited. One limitation is it is hard to cool it down to low temperatures. A second problem of anything thinking about analog is precision. The, the, the calibration precision, the, 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 the measurement precision. One can get the, the calibrated 
to a percent to a bit better, but not more. And that is the same reason why in classical computing, we switched from analog to digital. Just because when it's analog, we cannot really calibrate it well enough to scale. We cannot correct it, but digital we can. And so the same has to happen quantumly to go to a broader class of models, to really scale up, to make it more precise. We can need a gate model, I call it digital quantum computer that can be in a, 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 a corrected. And so with that now, I want to see kind of what is one of the simplest quantum models that I could simulate where a gate model machine could give me a quantum advantage. So how can I do something that if, uh, that one is done in the analog way and go beyond it by doing it digitally. And one of the simplest problems here that we've looked at that with your colleagues in Europe, especially the groups of your Andrew Daly, Peter Zoller, Emmanuel Bloch, and the team members, was to look at how many quantum gates and qubits do I need to get to a point where it's classically hard, but where I could do it analog and what is needed in a gate model approach. And in contrast to previous work, we didn't look at what we need to get the wave function to a certain fidelity. I cared more about properties I can measure. So we said, what do we need to get the measurements of certain local properties to the same point that they could do it, do it in an experiment, and that strongly relaxed the, the conditions. But we find still that for it to be hard, I need to do much more than about 50 the, 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 the quantum particles. And in this case, we looked at the, 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 the quantum magnet at transverse field, uh, field the, the, the ICM single model. And we said, we need to look at least at, at 10 times 10 lattice. So, so about the hundred quantum spins, which could be about the hundred qubits. That's where it gets hard classically. 64 or so I could still do kind of classically approximately nine times nine might get hard. So we we could choose nine or 10, I've chosen 10 here. And then I need to propagate it for a certain time. And the time has to be at least as long as the linear extent of the lattice or the system would not even see the size. So that's why, that's also so why I'm choosing a two dimensional lattice and not a one dimensional chain because in a 1D chain, I would have to propagate for a time of a hundred to see the system size. So here I'm choosing a 10 times 10 system and then propagating it for a time of 10. To describe it, I need just 100 qubits. And then to accurately mostly do it with the, a high fidelity in the simulation, I would need a very small time step. But what we found is if I relax the condition and say, I just want to simulate it well enough that is comparable to experiments. And compared to the precision I could get for measurements in experiments, given an unavoidable the, 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 the calibration error of about percent, I can actually take pretty large time steps. And then we found that one can do the simulation 100 qubits in just a few 10,000 gate operations. So this is great news because this is far smaller than what was your thought before that that with maybe 30,000 roughly your gate operations, we could get to the point where I'm doing something that is classically hard. But doing 30,000 gate operations still means the error on every single gate operation has to be less than like one in a million or the result will just be random noise. And so this is still 
way beyond the, 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 yeah, beyond the, beyond the NIST hardware really need the, 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 the fault tolerance. And then we estimate we need about 100,000 physical qubits to do that. But so with 100,000 physical qubits and the, uh, and the like, uh, fault tolerant simulations, we can solve quantum problems that are classically hard. That's not so far out. I think we that can be achieved in the next years. So let me now next go from, from this simplest problem to a really interesting problem that is commercially impactful and see what is needed there. And the problem there is one in chemistry. And I want to, to look at the problem on the catalysis. And we did a case study on a catalyst for, uh, for the carbon fixation. So we want to, for example, find a material that, that that helps us here take, take the CO2 from the, the, the atmosphere and turn it into methanol. And in order to do that, one can either try out many different catalysts, or we can try to predict how they work through calculation. And for that, we have to go through the reaction cycle. So on the left here, I have have the 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 the, 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 the catalyst here the, 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 the react with the the, the, the carbon dioxide molecule it binds it goes goes through steps it binds binds the, 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 the hydrogen the spits out the water and the, and it, 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 finally, yeah, methanol, and then the catalyst again binds with the next molecule. But for that to work, really, this reaction cycle has to be the dominant one. We don't want it to to, to go go elsewhere, be stuck with it, bind the catalyst clog it up, but we really want that just this cycle happens. And so we want to be able to predict and calculate it before we start and make the catalyst. And in order to do that, I have to look at all possible directions in which things could go, I have to look at all possible product state, all possible reaction pathways. And then I look at the energy along the reaction. And as they bind and react, there's a barrier. And the rate for the reaction is exponential in the energy height of the barrier divided by the temperature. So in order to know in which direction things react, I have to look at all possible paths, calculate the energies of these barriers, and then find out which barrier is lowest. And then I'm calculating the reaction rates. And then I hope that these barriers on this path that I want to achieve are the lowest. In order to do that, I need to know these energy differences. I need to know the barrier heights here during the reactions. And I need to know it accurate. I need to know it accurate compared to the temperature. Because if the accuracy is much, much less than the temperature, then it really just don't know where it goes. So it has to be at least the temperature. And so in this context, you have the chemical accuracy, as mentioned in the, 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 the tutorial, means I have to be able to calculate the energy better than the temperature. And the challenge here is that the temperature is an energy scale that's typically a million times smaller than the total energy of a molecule. So I have to really be able to calculate the energy to six, seven, eight, digits of precision. And many of the classical methods that were mentioned in the, 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 
the nickel tutorial, are then not good enough. And so that's where quantum computers come in. And it comes in into a workflow where I'm exploring possible structures. And then for these structures, I want to solve the problem on quantum hardware, or I want to solve it in some way. But classically, it's not good enough. And quantumly, I can't do it brute force because the molecule is too big. So what one then does is one looks at the, at the, the uh, certain configuration and extracts a model for the so-called active space where the chemistry is non-trivial. One solves that problem on quantum hardware and then one feeds it back to the classical calculation, looks at pathways, finds new candidates, and loops through that. So we'll want to do many calculations of that, of the accurate energies of the quantum system. And to do that, we're using quantum phase estimation. So we'd like to know the spectrum, and especially the ground state, and maybe the the low lying excited states and but all I can do on the quantum hardware is I can can like simulate the dynamics of a quantum system and so I want to implement the the time evolution of a quantum system. And if you combine that with phase estimation, then by measuring the phase the wave function picks up, I can get the energy because the phase picked up by an eigenstate is proportional to the energy of the state and the time. And thus by measuring the phase with phase estimation, I can get the energy of the state. And so it boils down ultimately to time evolution of a quantum state under the Hamiltonian, the energy function that describes the molecule. And I've shown before how for the quantum magnet, that was super easy. In the chemistry problem, it's a, it's a bit harder because the model is more complex. And the model, and the reason why it's more complex is that the, 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 the Coulomb interaction between electrons is long range. And so when I have two electrons interacting, they do that at any distance. And when I write down the model for, for, for an electronic system, or in a n orbital system, then the number of terms in the model is n to the power of four. From a complexity theory viewpoint, one has one because the number of your terms uh, terms is a polynomial. For each term, I have an efficient circuit to implement it. So the scaling is poly polynomial. But the scaling with n to the four number of terms scares me, scares me even classically. And so the question is, is it really efficient in a practical sense? Can I really do it well? What would it take to do it? Or are the constants so large that it might be hard? And when we first looked at that, it, it, it indeed looked hard, it looked bad. When we took, the, took, took a, 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 the, the algorithm, implemented it, and estimated the runtime, then with the, the, the assumptions we have now of a clock spe speed at the logically the, the, the level of microseconds, the runtime would be about a billion years. And a billion years is beyond the few weeks that I want to wait. 
we can't wait that long. But then, then with the tasting, they've reckoned others, we improved the implementations and brought the cost down by effect. Ten million, and at that time we said we can do it in a month. The reason why four years back we said it could be a month is that we assumed optimistically a future machine might be fast and might have a clock speed of nanoseconds. We now realize it's more more than a microsecond, so we say the runtime of those algorithms was about a century, much better than a billion years, but still too slow. But then in the last three years, we brought it down farther. Now we think that with about 5,000 logical qubits, we can do it in, in roughly a month. And I want to mention two of the advances that led to that. And the first advance is rethinking the problem we want to solve. We want to know the energies and so it can time and we want to know the wave functions, so the eigenstates. And for that, we want to time evolve with the model, the Hamiltonian. And that just takes time. One breakthrough here was that realizing if I don't care about the exact, uh, exact near dynamics, but I care about the spectrum, then I can do the calculations for, for negative, any function of the Hamiltonian. And it turns out that the time evolution under the arc sine of H is much more efficient to implement than under the H itself. And so a big step forward here was realizing that I can propagate with a certain function of H that makes it more efficient to get the 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 spectral the information, and so the runtime comes down per time step. The next thing we do is we have n to the four terms, but the question is, do we really need need that many? And so the, the next breakthroughs over the last years was looking at sparse representation. Can I look at those terms and write down a sparse representation, a sparse model for it that has fewer terms, but still has the same accuracy and that worked. And not only did the, the number of your terms go down, we also can make the time steps larger because of that. And so, so we can do fewer time steps and each one is faster. And that let us bring down the cost. But I think we are slowly reaching limits here because we're really thinking about what is really the minimal information that I need to describe the chemistry problem and it's still a small one. So there's still more breakthroughs needed here and I believe the next breakthroughs really have to come also from chemistry. Let me look at a second example for that. To illustrate why. And I want to look at a problem here again, a catalyst for nitrogen fixation. There are certain enzymes in microbes in the soil that can take nitrogen uh, from the air and turn it into ammonia, which is the basis here for the fertilizers. To understand how it works, you would in principle have to look at that big enzyme with about a thousand electrons and that problem with the scaling uh, and to the four is just far too big that we can ever do it brute force quantumly. It's super big, classically even. And so what one then does is one looks really at the, the active center, the core of it, and there is this Negev and Moko 
a cofactor that I mentioned at the, the, that I I mentioned that, 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 that mentioned earlier, and then we want to focus just at the center of it and just at a small lattice space of a few interesting orbitals. But as we do that, we have a problem because we're looking at the big molecule and then we're making a model just for this tiny active center. We're really truncating the model to just a tiny bit of the molecule and we throw out the rest. And the problem one has there is that this restriction to the active space, to the center, incurs an uncontrolled error. And so then we're using the quantum computer to totally precisely and accurately calculate the energy of a model that itself has an uncontrolled error that might be bigger than the temperature. So the problem here is really how do I do this embedding? How do I simulate this big molecule accurately if I can say, can, can look at a tiny piece of it, do that quantumly exactly, but how do I now make sure that the truncation error of getting to that problem does not make the exactness of the, 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 the quantum gear simulation irrelevant. So we have to solve this problem, which chemists call the dynamic correlation problems. All the actions with the rest of the system. And that is a problem that we need to start solving now, because unless we solve it, the exact energy from quantum hardware will not really take us all the way. And the good news is being motivated by this and starting to work on solving that problem in new ways because of the motivation from quantum can help us classically even before we have the near thousands of qubits needed to solve the chemistry problem. I want to end by showing one other area where the same thing happened. Because when we talk about quantum and quantum impact, cryptography is one, simulation is the other, but we also for a long time one talked about the optimization. And there are many different problems, hard problems, where optimization methods appear in fault diagnosis for oil and gas, material discovery, power grids, grids signal processing, machine learning, scheduling, logistics, traffic, whatever. There are loads of problems where we want to solve a hard optimization problem. And the hope was that using quantum effects, one can more easily escape from a local minimum. And instead of climbing over the barrier, one can just quantum tunnel through it. And that, that was the, 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 the motivation for building your quantum hardware to to quantum annealing. And there have been cases that one can build and construct where the quantum tunneling is exponentially better than climbing over the barrier. But what we realized over the last decade looking at quantum annealers is that you can mimic it classically. You can simulate it efficiently classically. And so you can mimic the quantum tunneling on a classical computer. And thus, what that led to is a quantum inspired algorithm, where basically one takes the ideas of the quantum algorithm, one dequantizes it, and one turns the quantum algorithm into a related classical algorithm that, that with the color sampling gives us much of the speed up from the you know, quantum algorithm already your classical hardware. And so that is you know, the, 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 the one example we're thinking about quantum algorithms and how we use them 
gave us new ideas for, for neoclassical algorithms that can be used already now. And one example was we worked with New York, with New York, case West the Reserve University to to find pi sequences for for magnetic resonance near imaging that reduce the scan time by a factor three, which is. Uh, a big breakthrough there. And uh, similarly, I predict that the breakthrough we make in chemistry by thinking about quantum will lead to breakthroughs there even before we have the quantum hardware scaled up. And so to end now, what I've been trying to show today is that to really get quantum advantage for a practical problem in the next decades, we need to focus on a problem that has small data, big compute problems, and to really beat the classical hardware we have, we need to look for problems with more than quadratic speed up. Even the simplest application problems, problems will need fault tolerance, the hundreds of, of thousands of qubits to beat the, 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 the best the best, uh, the, the, the best uh, the, 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 the classical algorithms. Once we get to millions, there are loads of your chemistry problems that will solve the interesting one like the, the, the carbon fixation and more. That's where. Uh, they can help, but even on the way there, in the, in the decade it takes us to get there, there will be breakthroughs in classical methods, just from tackling the classical chemistry problems we need to solve to make the quantum hardware useful. So on the way to building the million year qubit machine, we'll have lots of progress from quantum computing on classical hardware. Thank you. Great, uh, thanks, um, thanks, Matthias, for, for a great talk. Um, actually, I was very, um, you know, it was very interesting to uh, to see that um, your very pragmatic view about um, about uh, quantum advantage and quantum algorithms sort of um, coincided with the complexity theoretic view where where we always look for super polynomial or exponential speedups, you know, rather than polynomial speedups, which we treat treat as being somewhat suspicious. So it's uh, yeah. it, it's actually very interesting that the two ends of this spectrum agree more than the middle. Um, so um, let's let's open it up to uh, some questions before we get to the panel. Um, so. Uh, Let's see, is, uh, let me just see if there, uh, do any of the, uh, the moderators have? Uh... I actually had a, in the meantime, had a, had a question. Um, you know, where, at the beginning of your talk, you, um, you sort of, um, you know, you had these calculations, uh, you know, saying that um, that the clock speed of a quantum computer would necessarily be, um, you know, many orders of magnitude slower than a than a yeah. classical computer. So, is that um, is 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 that a is that a practical consideration currently, or is that is there something inherently true about it, even looking somewhat far into the future? So I think this can likely be improved with breakthroughs in quantum area correcting codes. But I think it is fundamental. And the reason is that at the lowest level, I have physical qubits. And I have to control the physical qubits. I have to do the physical gate operations. And that needs a classical computer to control and to do 
the, the, the manipulation of the quantum state. And if you then, on top of that, do the syndromic measurement cycles, so that then things slow down because let's say for the surface code, and I need a code distance of maybe about 20 or 30, and each cycle is about 10 gates to implement. So I have a few hundred gate operational cycles that I do. And thus I, have, I am at least a factor of a few hundred slower than the classical computer that controls the physical gate operations. Then I also have the space overhead of quantum uh, area correction. And if I take a code distance of 20 in a surface code, then it means I need about a thousand physical qubits for a logical qubit. Okay, it might have a be a hundred or hundred or thousands, but still I have a few orders of a magnitude more, <laughs> more physical qubits than logical qubits. With that, I'm about a defect of a hundred thousand. And then the qubit is just much more complex than a transistor. Mm -hmm. So the classic logic I need to actually control the qubit is a factor of 100,000 bigger. So then I have my next factor of 100. And so, so just from simple arguments, I'm now at a factor 100 million already. Mm -hmm. I see that. That's really illuminating. Um, and then it's the size on that chip. I can really squeeze tiny transistors. I don't know if you can make the qubit so small and fit that many on a single wafer. So, so, and that's then the, the, the next factor, a thousand is, is kind of the density or, or the size of the physical qubit compared to the size of the transistor. Mm -hmm. So I think, the, the, I think if the breakthrough really comes on the classical side with the classical control, then it will profit also the classical computing. So the breakthrough has to come in either much better qubits or in new QEC codes that could maybe give us a breakthrough or both. That's how we can shave off of that. Great. Um, Mesh, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Yeah, sure. Okay. So uh, just, I just wanted to make sure I understood your discussion of the transverse field yeah. Eisen model. So one, I just want to make sure I, I, I got the basics right. So you were saying that uh, a 10 by 10 system with 100 qubits, 30,000 gate operations. Did I understand correctly that you thought that that was within reach on the scale of a year? Was that? No. 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 I'm uh, okay. So, I'm so I said this is something that is just beyond what I can do classically. I don't think I can do it accurately to that precision of about a percent for the prediction over that time on a classical computer, I don't know any classic algorithm that can get us there. No, no, my, my question was on a, on, on a NISC device. On, with, with yes. that, and then I'm saying your... on a NISC device, if, you, if I need to do 30,000 rotation gates accurately, mm -hmm. and I want to have a result that's accurate to 99%, then I need a fidelity on my qubits that is about seven nines on the gate operations. And because I want to do about 50,000 gate operations, and the negative uh, error rate should be less than 1%. And so I need an error per gate operation of less than like, one in a few million. And I'm saying that NISC machines don't currently have any roadmap towards that, but we need fault tolerance. Okay, maybe I should have asked the question more stupidly. What do you think might be possible with NIST devices on the transverse field Ising model? Let me ask the question that way. Yeah. NIST devices on the transverse field Ising model on a size that I, I can't reach classically. Yes, I know you love the model. Let's take a hundred spins and then per time step, mm -hmm. you need to have at least one rotation gate per term. And so mm -hmm. you so say per time step, we need about 300 or about a thousand gate operations, say for one time step. Mm -hmm. And with three nice fidelities, that means I can do one time step and things start to randomize. And once one time step, we can still do classically. Okay. But when you can go for 10 time steps and mm -hmm. you can, can choose a big time step, then it becomes hard classically. Right. So okay. I'd say on, on NISC devices, you know, 
I want to change my answer. I want to say, if you insist on using it like a digital machine, if you're using an analog quantum system, and now mm -hmm. you insist that you only have the discrete gate operations of a digital computer, then you combine the disadvantages of analog being noisy and digital being restricted. What you should actually do is you should take the analog machine and use it as an analog machine. And then you can do loads. So, so if you use the qubit and just view it as an analog quantum simulator, then there are many people here also in the, the, the audience who've done that for decades and, and that and there you can do, do a lot. And that was even done recently by, by, by the wave on their systems when they started to look at their machine as an analog simulator for an icing model, then they can do interesting work there. But when you, you look at a NISC machine, that's my point of view now, as an analog machine and you use it like a gate model machine, then you are handicapping the, being the device. Mm -hmm. The discrete okay. gates that becomes useful once you have fault tolerance, you need it for that. Mm -hmm. So NIST devices have already for a long time solved nice icing models in an analog way. You don't need to wait a year, you can have it now. Um, quickly, I think uh, Ike Chuang has a question. Uh, Thanks, Umesh. And thank you, Matthias, for a wonderful talk. And um, my question is about the second half of your talk. Yep. You mentioned having breakthroughs for maybe devices and quantum error correction, but how about, divide, how about breakthroughs based on asking better questions? And specifically, uh, I noticed that you're still focusing on eigenvalue estimation using phase estimation. Yep. But in your beautiful work with Microsoft and Guanghao Lo and so forth uh, on this new singular value transform algorithm, it allows you to um, ask more sophisticated questions like polynomial transforms of the eigenvalue spectrum, as you know very well. Yes. Can you think of better questions that take advantage of that so that you ask a, a big quantum question and then transform the system so you can answer that all at once? That's a good place. So here basically we have transformed the problem using those, uh, those, uh, those you know, tricks of your Guang Hao and others and yours kind of, to, to say we can transform the problem to make it easier to solve. Uh, but, and, but then we still looked at the energy of the spectrum. The, the bigger question is, are there any practical applications for quantum algorithms that we have not thought about yet? Or chemically relevant polynomial transformed questions um, like uh, uh, reaction rates or yes. thresholds or asking about ranges of eigenvalues instead. And yeah. I, I know this is an extended question and I don't want to get into the panel time too long, but maybe if you have a brief answer. So the brief answer is basically for reaction rates and simulate often boils down to energies. And for energies, you run into the uncertainty principle so that the time you need to do something to get it to a certain level is bounded from below. And that's likely the answer. Without that, you could maybe be, uh, avoid Heisenberg. And so there might be a way to reformulating that in a question. Can we prove a lower bound on that? Or, or can, can by breaking through lower bounds in some smart way, one could have ideas how to get the energies better? Great. Thank you. OK, well, thanks. Thanks again, uh, Matthias. That was, that was a great uh, uh, colloquium. So now we, we move on to 